Welcome into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Uh, Today is the day after the NBA trading deadline, so some dust starting to settle in the NBA, seeing what the teams are looking like with their new rosters, and there may be some additions still to come, as the buyout market should be uh, pretty active, mostly from guys who, you know, thought you might get traded and didn't end up getting a deal. So we're going to start off the show talking about the biggest names that are hitting the buyout market. The one everybody's been talking about uh, hasn't quite happened just yet, but it's imminent because there's a list of teams he's meeting with, and that's Andre Drummond. The details of how much money he's going to give back I don't think are fully out there yet, but he's going to have to give some back. Otherwise, Cleveland's not going to you know help him go to a a good team just – out of the kindness of their hearts. Reports are Andre Drummond's meeting with the Lakers, the Clippers, and then a couple of surprise teams, the Celtics, Hornets, and Knicks. Sap, why is he meeting with the Celtics, Hornets, and Knicks? That's a good point, Jeff, because if he's interested in trying to win a championship, you keep the conversation to the Lakers, Clippers, maybe even open up talks with Brooklyn, although it seems like Brooklyn has pretty much solidified their roster. Uh, I have no idea why he's looking at going to the Celtics, the Knicks, or Charlotte. I don't think any of those teams are going to sniff the conference finals, let alone the NBA finals. You know, if he was going to look at at someplace else, maybe Miami would have been a good option. But Miami has Bam Adebayo, uh, who's outstanding at center, much more versatile than Andre Drummond. Drummond does add a lot. I mean, he has his flaws, right? He's an old school center, but... He's a guy who's averaged 17, 18 points per game, 13, 14 rebounds. Uh, He has a liability at the free throw line, which is an issue in tight games, but maybe he's not going to be on the court in in tight games in the postseason. I think he ends up with the Lakers. They really do need him uh, because we're not going to see Anthony Davis probably for another three weeks. We not see LeBron for another month. And, And the Lakers are quickly losing ground in the Western Conference. They're only two games ahead of Dallas for the nine seed in the Western Conference. So you want to avoid that at all costs. So I think that that's something you have to kind of play around with. I I take that back. They're two games behind Dallas for the seven seed, so they don't want to dip into the seven seed because it's part of that one-game type play-in. So they need to make some move, or they're just going to lose contact with the contenders. And and you've said it a million times, as long as they're in the postseason and LeBron and AD are healthy that they should be fine, but I'm still concerned if they're seven, eight, nine, or 10 with that real crazy one game type playing. So I think Drummond goes to the Lakers or the Clippers. The Clippers made, I think a really good move at the trade deadline in acquiring Rajon Rondo. I think he gives them that veteran leadership that they lack and uh, we'll see what happens. But is there any explanation that you can think of why Drummond would want to play for the Celtics, the Hornets or the Knicks other than the Knicks, we're going to have a lot of money next year so you know maybe he signs long term with the Knicks but the Knicks going to do that for Andre Drummond yeah the the only explanations I can think of is uh, uh, the agent wants to have a good relationship with those teams so he's doing his agent a favor uh, or that as a condition of the buyout it wasn't he couldn't make it obvious he was going to the Lakers like just saying like come on give us a break here because the Cavs I don't think have the greatest relationship in the world with the Lakers because LeBron is there and they you know they took they took uh, their baby in free agency LeBron James the, the son of Akron uh so I, I yeah I think it's just for like it's got to be a favor to his agent or uh something to be like save face for the for the Cavs to make it seem like Hey, I gave these other teams a chance. They could have had me. I didn't like their pitches. Like, what realistically, how, what are the Hornets or the Celtics or even the Knicks going to pitch them? I guess the Knicks could say, yeah, we have a lot of money, like you mentioned, Sap. Mm-hmm. You know, we can pay you the most. But, like, what's the Celtics pitch? We'll, we'll play you, but probably not as much as you'd like. And we're also going to lose in the first round, but Hey, you get to play for a coach that's going to get fired after the postseason's over. Like what's the, I don't know what the real appeal would be. You're in so Charlotte. pessimistic. You're so pessimistic, Jed. I thought you would have talked yourself off the bridge from last night after no, the no. moves that Danny Ainge made, but you appear to be even in worse shape today than you were yesterday. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it. And I think you bring up a great point. Like let's throw five teams out there 
So it looks like we're doing our due diligence, but in the end, it's going to be the Lakers or the Clippers. Because right. I it's would like, think like in that situation, Anthony Davis came up with his list, right, of teams right. he'd be traded to. He's like, yeah, I'd go to the Bucks. Uh, sure, why not? He threw a dart at a board of the United States and was like, yeah, the Bulls, maybe I'd go there. He's just making it yeah. up. Well, it's kind of like Russell Wilson with the Seahawks. He put up his agent put up four potential destinations, and we never really bought into like two of them or even at this point three of them because a lot of those teams already addressed their quarterback needs so he's just doing due diligence like the Raiders like the no Lakers. one believed that no or the Bears who you know what if Russell Wilson went to the Bears he'd cease being a great quarterback they've never had a great quarterback in my lifetime and the Cowboys you knew were going to resign Dak Prescott in New Orleans um you know they're going to move on from Drew Brees to Russell Wilson and the ramifications of the salary cap. But back to basketball, I think in the end, Drummond ends up with the Lakers or the Clippers. That makes the most sense, doesn't it? Because those are still the two best teams in the Western Conference when healthy. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's always been the Lakers. I mean, I don't know that uh, the Clippers have anybody on their team that's nearly the recruiter that LeBron James is. So if, you know, it comes down to that, then obviously the edge goes to the Lakers because he's, he's a tr- tremendous recruiter. He's shown that throughout the course of his career. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's the Lakers. I think it's been the Lakers for a while. All this other stuff seems like window dressing to me. Like he's, you know, just sort of, eh, you know, it well, wasn't always the Lakers. Uh, I like you too, Charlotte. You know, I've maybe buy some of my jerseys, and sh- buy my Laker jersey, Charlotte fans. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I really think it's the Lakers. If I was going to uh, Vegas and had to put down some money, that's where I would, uh, I would put down, I wouldn't even spread it around. I would just put it all on the Lakers. I, I, the Clippers, I, I like, again, what they did with Rondo, like you said, uh, I just, I don't, is he going to like really be super motivated? Like what's Kawhi or Paul George going to say to him? I mean. I think that LeBron is the key here. If LeBron wants Anthony, sorry, wants Andre Drummond, he'll probably get Andre Drummond. He's tough to say no to, right, LeBron? And and again, you wouldn't think Kawhi would be a great recruiter. I'm I'm shocked at that. The man doesn't communicate. How could he possibly recruit? He's he's nearly silent most of the time, right? He he doesn't have that skill set. Marvelous basketball player, but he's not what I would think of as a personality that's going to go out and, and recruit. LeBron's the best at that. He hasn't always succeeded. You know, he, he tried to get Paul George and that didn't work out. And maybe he benefited from not getting Paul George. He did get the player he wanted more than any. And that was Anthony Davis. So I, I think Drummond goes to the Lakers. They need him. You could be looking at a starting lineup in the postseason of Drummond, Anthony Davis at the four, who's much more comfortable there than playing center. LeBron could play the three, but he kind of plays every position. And then you get Schroeder and KCP in the backcourt. And your bench would have the likes of Harold, Gasol, uh, THT Caruso that that's a pretty good bench uh, as well so I think that they would be in really good shape to get back to the finals yeah you know the Lakers offer him it's not just the, the fact that they offer him a championship they probably offer him the biggest role of, of those teams too maybe yep. outside of the uh, Hornets um, you know the Knicks have he's I just the Knicks are such a weird team to put on there other than money so I mean I guess he would play a big role in that team but it, it it doesn't really make much sense. The Celtics, you would imagine he'd be playing splitting time with Robert Williams and Tristan Thompson. So like, it's not like there's a ton of playing time available for him there. So I don't know why that's attractive to him at all. And uh, you know, the, the Clippers have Zubac, who's a, a good center. So, I mean, the Lakers are desperate for size and he, he provides it. So I think, listen, playing in LA, you get the nice weather. You get a team that has serious championship potential. You get to play with LeBron and you have the biggest role. It seems like a no brainer to me, unless he's very concerned about making more money, but he just got a big contract buyout. He's, he's a free agent in the off season. So the only way I could see him not signing with Lakers is if his only priority is money. Right. And he's made a ton of money already. And I'm sure he'll be able to get a, a good contract going forward. This is your opportunity to try to win a championship. But the big question is how important is that to him? Is money the most important thing, which in general it is. And I agree with players. That's, you know, what you're going to have when you retire and you can have generational wealth. But when you get that opportunity to right. play with the best player of all time, well, in my opinion, in LeBron James, the guys go who, for it. 
the guy who's who money is their top priority typically don't take a buyout of their contract. Correct. Uh, where they're giving money back. So I, I would be pretty surprised if that's his main priority in this uh, brief, I guess, free agency period he'll have. But he's going to meet with those teams again, Lakers, Celtics, Hornets, Clippers, and Knicks. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out. But again, if the, the smart money would be on the Lakers. I would be really surprised to see it be any of those other teams. Mm-hmm. I'd be downright shocked if it's the Celtics, Hornets, or Knicks. Uh, the other big name, maybe less effective player than Drummond, I would say, at this point in his career, but certainly the more accomplished uh, over the course of his career is LaMarcus Aldridge. He's getting bought out by the Spurs. Uh, he is going to meet with the Heat, the Lakers also, uh, Clippers, and Nets. Uh, the the uh, house money seems to be on Miami here. Uh, where do you think LaMarcus Aldridge ends up? And do you think LaMarcus Aldridge is helpful to a team that he ends up with? I think it's going to be Miami. I think he can help somewhat. I don't think he's going to be a big impact signing. I think Drummond can mean more to the Lakers than Aldridge does to the Miami Heat. Uh, And speaking about recruiters, who's a better recruiter than Pat Riley? There's not many. I think Pat Riley and Jerry West are probably the two best executives in the NBA as far as being recruiters. Now, West is with the L.A. Clippers, so you've got L.A. to sell, and Pat Riley has Miami to sell that that's a good start there it's not like you're trying to sell uh, you know cold city in the midwest i would think that aldridge ends up in miami that seems to be where all the reports are that he is going to go he looks like he is well past his prime uh maybe three or four years past his prime he's always appeared to me to be a guy that was never in great shape he's a skilled guy but not an athletic guy but i think he could be a, a nice piece for the miami heat you know you, you add him to butler uh, and out of bio, I don't think he gives him a big three. He's not that type of player anymore, but certainly a veteran player that, that has a nice mid range game. Um, and they've got some three point shooters there, obviously. And, um, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero. So I think he could fit into Miami and they're a team. I think if they could make that one more move, they'd really solidified being the four seed in the Eastern conference. And with those types of players, with that coaching staff, w- with how tough they are, they would still be a tough out for even Brooklyn. Brooklyn would beat them in the second round. I'm not even, you know, going to doubt that, but they, they put them through a lot because that's a tough minded team. I think he ends up in Miami. That makes the most sense. Yeah. He's, he's dropped off a lot, even from last season where he averaged uh, 19 points a game and uh, five and a half re sorry, seven rebounds a game. Uh, this year he's averaging 13 and four and a half rebounds. So a uh, pretty significant drop off. He's 35. Uh, he still can do some stuff. You know, I think that he's a guy that you don't want to be playing more than 20 minutes a game if you mm-hmm. have to. Uh, so I think he'll fit on, on Miami. I mean, they just traded away Olenek. He's not as good of a three point shooter, but he's just as good of a mid range shooter. He's probably a little bit of a better rebounder than Olenek. So I could see him playing that role. No problem. Uh, so yeah, I think he'd be a good fit for Miami. Uh, interesting that he's meeting with the Lakers Clippers and Nets as well. Obviously his intentions are pretty clear. He wants to play for a team that has, you know, a shot at winning a championship. Uh, he is never won one in his career with Portland and San Antonio. Uh, is there any chance you think he ends up on either any of those teams or you think it's, it's just Miami all the way? I would think Miami all the way. Although if the Lakers aren't able to get Drummond is Aldridge, a uh, decent second prize again I don't think he offers you the rebounding that Drummond does and the Lakers need to do that now the Lakers have some issues even when healthy they have not been a good three-point shooting team this year their defense against the three-point is still very very good that's where they you know the two of those combined was a big reason when they won the championship last year he may be the second prize right if you if you want Drummond uh, and you can't get him then Aldridge is the next best piece I, I would think that Aldridge will fit in better in Miami. But we're at the point now, Jet, where Brooklyn, the Clippers, and the Lakers are in on everyone, right? I mean, they're, they're in that yeah. situation where they're going to try to win a ring, and these players that are going to be in the buyout market, as you said, are going to try to win a ring as well. So those are all perfect marriages. Miami seems to make the most sense, and I think, again, Pat Riley's a great recruiter. I mean, you sit down with the Don, right, the godfather. <laughs> I think that you know he can sell LaMarcus Aldridge on Miami, uh, and the culture they've built there over the years since Riley's been there. 
Uh, let me throw out a couple more names at you. Not as sexy as the last two, Seth, but you tell me of these guys, if any of them interests you, if you're a team, you know, trying to, I guess, compete or contend. Uh, Avery Bradley, Kelly Olnick, Otto Porter Jr. Of those three guys, who would you most want if you're a contending team? I've always been a huge fan of Avery Bradley. And I, I think last year, before the pandemic, he was playing really good basketball for the Lakers. He, he can hit three-pointers. He also could defend three-pointers. I don't know what the relationship is now with the Lakers because he did not go to the bubble. Um, he's got a young child who I think is somewhat sickly that he wanted to spend time with. And I always support anyone that does that over their profession. I don't think that would leave him on bad terms with the Lakers. I think he could be a useful piece. Uh, Olenek is someone who is averaging 10.7 rebounds a game in about 26 minutes um, with the Heat. Now he's on Houston. Houston's kind of like a clearinghouse for all these players, right? They go to Houston and then they want to get the hell out of there. Houston's in the the most like ridiculous rebuild I think I've ever seen. They got rid of one of the best players and didn't get much in return, so they're god-awful now. Um, Otto Porter Jr., he's He's a guy who's drafted very high and keeps moving around. So I, I, I'm not really sold on him. Bradley on the right team could be a nice addition as well. And again, I go back to the Lakers because they need some three point shooting. Uh, you know, now they need someone who can kind of back up Schroeder because they were somewhat in on Kyle Lowry. That didn't work. Um, maybe the Lakers go add another veteran. The Lakers are all about veterans at this point, right? And that's what you're going to get in the bio market. Obviously, they weren't looking to add young players. If anything, they'll move young players or would have moved young players at the trade deadline. I, I think Bradley can still play. Um, again, is his heart into it? That's the big question. And, and with the pandemic, you, I think you've seen some players that they're there, but they're not totally there. So that's always a question to have. I think those are three guys that, that – can help someone's bench. I think Olenek to the Celtics makes some sense. Um, you know, he had good success here. He's only shooting 31% from three this year, which is down um, from his career average, which is around 37, 38%. And again, that's in a half a season. Maybe he can get those numbers to tick up a little bit. And I think Olenek with the Celtics wouldn't be a bad fit because he's not really going to get in the way of Robert Williams. They can play together since Olenek is a stretch four. So I think that that might be a decent addition. You say that he's not going to get in the way of Robert Williams, but considering the way the Celtics have used Robert Williams and Brad Stevens seems so opposed to the idea, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Olenek came to the Celtics and they just shelved Robert Williams in, in favor of Olenek. It's just like that's, that seems to be how it goes uh, for whatever bizarre reason. Uh, if, if I'm the Celtics, yeah, I'd entertain it for, for because he was somewhat successful here, but uh I think they meet, they need more help at, at the backup guard spot mm -hmm. and obviously wing depth. I'd actually be more interested in Otto Porter Jr. If I was the Celtics, than I would mm -hmm. be in uh, an Olenek. Otto Porter Jr. is a three and D guy. Who's not that great at either of those things. He's, he's solid, right? This season he's shooting 40% from three. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, career. He's a, he's a 40% three point shooter. Uh, he's only averaging 10 points a game this year though. So you're not going to get a ton of scoring. Uh, he was the third overall pick sap. So yes, he was a very high pick he yeah. got way the hell overpaid, uh, by the wizards a few years ago, like close to max contract overpaid for some bizarre reason. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I guess he could, it, it all depends on fit with these guys, right? If you're talking about a guy like Avery Bradley or Kelly Olenek or Otto Porter jr. It's a matter of what, what, what team can utilize their skill set the best? Because they're not going to be guys who are skilled at, at a lot of different things. They might have one particular set of skills, like uh, Liam Neeson's character in Taken, um, <laughs> that uh, you know helps helps a championship team. You know, I think all three of those guys, Olenek, Bradley, and Porter, can bring something to the bench of a team that's trying to compete. Um, so that's where I feel like they'd all be best served, but the likelihood that all three of them end up on really good teams seems low. So we'll see. I think all of them will end up getting signed because they have all have something that is, you know, a, what an NBA team is looking for. Olenek seven feet tall. There's always a market for seven feet tall dudes who can shoot threes. And Bradley's a, a rugged defender. And I think a pretty well-respected veteran in the league. Um, and Otto Porter Jr. is a 27-year-old former thir third overall pick. So it'll all end up somewhere. It's just a matter of 
you know, if, if a team's expecting a lot out of those guys, they're not, they're not going to be happy with the result. Kind of like, do you remember how it was a big deal when, uh, Troy Murphy was bought out mm-hmm. and everybody here in Boston was very excited about bringing in Troy Murphy, probably cause he was Irish. Uh, <laughs> And they yeah. he just he gave them nothing, just absolutely nothing. So I think the buyout market sometimes gets a little bit overhyped in terms of this guy's going to come in and really change a lot of things. Like there's a reason that a lot of these dudes get bought out, and it's not because they're spectacular players. It's because they have some flaw, or some hole in their game. Even with Drummond, you know the numbers indicate, wow, look at this guy. Like he should be an all star every year. He's averaging a high double double. He's he's the best rebounder in the league. But his defense isn't that good. His offensive game is is you know a way throwback. So there's a reason he got traded for virtually nothing last year, and this year couldn't even be moved because no one was willing to give up anything of value for him. So I think the via market tends to be a little bit overplayed because it, the again they're bought out for a reason, not because they're amazing players. If they're amazing players, no one's just gonna hand them their walking papers. No, I mean, these are just fringe players at this point could serve as a ninth or 10th guy on a bench, whatever the case may be. So we'll see what happens with that. I think that Drummond's the best player of the group because he does have one skill that he's really good at, which is rebounding, which always is something that you need. You know, Pat Riley famously said, no rings, uh, no rebounds, no rings. And and it, it still holds in today's NBA. I know that the league has changed since Pat Riley uttered those words in the 80s, but rebounding is still a pretty damn important skill set to have for an individual and for a team yeah it's it's massively important and in the playoffs those extra possessions really really matter so uh he's more of a defensive rebounder but that Mm -hmm. you know gives them other doesn't let the other team get second chance opportunities so uh yeah i think listen if he goes to the lakers it's a the lakers lose nothing and they gain a lot so it's a it's a Mm -hmm. it's a great scenario for la i'm just saying in general people get way too excited about the guys that they might add on the buyout market because again, they're on the buyout market for a reason, not because they're world beaters. So we'll see how that shakes out. We'll see uh, if there's any other names that, uh, that come to the, the buyout list. Uh, typically there's not names that are, are very surprising, but I guess you never know. Uh, Sap, you ran a poll this week as you want to do. And your poll was asking the good people of Twitter What's the better duo, right? This was a Twitter poll. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown of the Boston Celtics or Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson of the New Orleans Pelicans. How did the poll shake out before you and I get into this? I think it was a fair question, right? I mean, that that's a viable discussion to have. Sure. Uh, yeah. The people that responded, 73% said, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, 27% said Zion and Brandon Ingram. Now, that was, predictable. That, that was predictable. <laughs> I thought it should have been in the real world, you know, 54, 46, you know, pretty close numbers. Instead, it was 73, 27. I have more Celtic fans or Celtic honks as followers than Pelicans followers and honks. And I don't even know if there are any Pelican honks out there. There are certainly a lot of Celtics honks. But uh, 73-27 in favor of the Boston duo. Uh, that, well, yeah, obviously the number doesn't surprise me because, uh, you know, like you said, you have more Celtics fans as your followers. You have that uh, – you've been working in this market for a while, even though you've never embraced the Celtics. So I don't know why a Celtics fan would follow you. In fact, I would actively mute you if I was a Celtics fan on Twitter. That's... They trolled me. They actually trolled me, which is fun. <laughs> That's what Twitter's good yeah, no, for, to yeah, troll each other. I mean, you, all you do is troll the teams in Boston, though it's it's not too hard to troll the Red Sox these days, so it's not like anybody would particularly care. And that's the one I defend the most, because I'm like, <laughs> we all grew up Red Sox fans. My dad was born in 1924. He died in 1999. He never saw the Red Sox win a World Series. You guys, you know, in your early 30s, have seen them win four World Series and are complaining. I'm like, You know, it hasn't been a bad franchise since John Henry and that group bought it back in 2002. It's been 20 years, four World Series. That's pretty good. They're actually the one I defend. It's not just the four World Series. They're four and oh in the World Series since I've been alive. They've never lost. Never lost. (laughs) Yeah. They're they're like Jordan in the NBA Finals, you know, (laughs) six and oh for Jordan, four and oh for the Red Sox. And none of those series have gone 
to a seventh game, right? I mean, they, they swept the Cardinals in 04. They swept Colorado in 07. They beat the Cardinals in six games in 2013. Then they beat the Dodgers in five in 2018. Yeah, they've run rough so shot through every team. They're 16-3 and three in the World Series. It's like a fait accompli that Red Sox get to the World Series. They're going to win. Now, for older Red Sox fans, it was they'll get to the World Series and lose in seven games, which they did in 1946, 67, 75, and 86. So I somewhat defend the Red Sox. I will never forgive them for trading Mookie Betts, which is going to go down as the dumbest move they've made since selling Babe Ruth 100 years ago. But I defend the organization somewhat because they've been successful, certainly more successful over the last 20 years than the Celtics, who seem to have all this goodwill built up among their fan base, and certainly better than the Bruins, who have a lot of goodwill built up from their fan base. The Patriots are in a different situation. When you go to nine Super Bowls and win six in a 20-year period, it's really tough to knock them. But, uh, yeah, the one team I will defend is the Red Sox. So, yeah, I don't have a lot of uh, Boston fans that like what I have to say or write. Remember the first column I ever wrote for the Boston Herald was six and a half years ago, and it was LeBron is greater than Larry Bird. And I just remember walking into the newsroom at the Herald and having every old white guy look at me like they wanted to bite my head off. I think seven years yeah. later, I've been, I've been, you know, uh, that was a good way to ingratiate correct. yourself to the, yes, exactly. to the community. Yeah. I think that was yep, really absolutely. good. Uh, first column, this a so- is coming out with what? <laughs> I was shocked with some of the columns that let you write. They let you write one about like who you'd want to go to dinner with and all of history. They just let you write whatever the hell you wanted. Pretty much, yeah. It was funny because maybe that's know, why the her- paper is in the state of this today. Yeah, you get you got <laughs> me putting down like three dinner guests because that's a question I like to always ask people. Like, if you had your choice, three dinner guests. It could be people that are alive, people that are dead, fictitious characters. Pick anybody. And and mine were Thomas Jefferson. Leonardo da Vinci and Richard Nixon. And then I put together how the dinner would go. And it, it was, a, you know, kind of a very uh, fun column. Yeah, they let me write pretty much whatever I wanted. I think they just thought it was a nuisance and said, yeah, just let the guy write whatever he wants. No one's going to read him anyway. No one takes him seriously. I was just a page filler mine, on Sundays. Mine currently would be Brad Stevens, Wick Grousebeck, and Danny Ainge. And it would oh. be the most uncomfortable dinner ever. It would just be a lot of silence, a lot of side eyes and stink eyes, a lot of scowling. Uh, me just throwing up my hands and saying, why are you doing this to me? But that's who I would choose. Those three. And those, those guys would need food tasters too, with you involved. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably I, they, I, would I wouldn't try them. to, I wouldn't try to, to kill them, but I wouldn't want them to have the most comfortable bathroom experience. No, that's, I would, I would want them. Gonna say. Uh, <laughs> so, I kind of have a sense of where you're going with this poll question, Sap, based off of your history and your columns. Why are Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson a better duo than Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown? Okay, as far as the numbers go, it's incredible how close they are. This year alone, and that's a half a season, but that's a really good sample size because this is Zion Williamson's second year in the league, and and I think he's just continually getting better. In terms of points per game, New Orleans – Duo is averaging 50 per game. Boston's 49.5. Boston leads in rebounding 12.5 to 12.1. They lead in assist 8.2 to 8.1. They're both shooting 38% from three. Now Zion doesn't really take threes, but Brandon Ingram's damn good at it. A couple of reasons. He should should take threes. He should. He's not bad at it. His first game in the league. His first game he he canned like like four. four. Yeah. In the first (laughs) half, I'm like, I'm sure he could do this. Uh, you also can run your offense through Zion. And the Celtics lost to New Orleans about a month ago. And at, in the second half, and the Celtics were up by 20 uh, at some point in that game, they decided to run their offense through Zion. He's a really good passer, as is Brandon 26. Ingram. 26. Set. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was uh, probably the worst loss game. of the year, which is pretty <laughs> tough to do in the NBA. I don't care who you're playing, uh, even if it's Zion and Brandon Ingram. One of the reasons I like the New Orleans duo is their age. Zion is 20. Brandon Ingram is 23. Uh, Jason Tatum's also 23 for the Celtics and Jalen Brown's 24. So the, the New Orleans duo is a little bit younger. So I think they have more room to grow. I think of the four players, Zion is going to be the best player. I think Ingram and Brown are nearly a wash, right? I mean, they, they were in the same draft. Ingram was the second pick. Jalen Brown was the third pick. And I, I think if you look at their careers, they, they're pretty similar. I mean, pick whichever one you like. Uh, I think Ingram's a more natural scorer. I think Brown's a slightly better defender, but I, I think 
you know, one for one, they're pretty equal. I think Zion is going to be better than Jason Tatum. Tatum is wildly skilled. I don't see the desire in Jason Tatum to be as great as he can be. I do see that with Zion. And I think that's the biggest reason I would take the New Orleans duo over the Celtics duo. Yeah, I get Zion having the the highest ceiling. I mean, that's that's sort of hard to argue. He was the number one overall pick in the draft, uh, and his ceiling seems like it, it could be as high as he wants it to be. The biggest question with Zion, and it's a question that you don't really have to to ask of the other guys on this list, especially the two Celtics guys, is durability. You know, Zion mm-hmm. has questions about the shape he's in. I don't think anybody's asked questions about the shape that Jalen Brown's been in since he was probably in middle school. Uh, no. And Jason Tatum's in, in tremendous shape, too. I mean, he's not the muscular dude that, that Jalen Brown is, but he's he's got he's put on muscle and weight since he's coming in the NBA. And That's so a perfect I think NBA that physique. He's, yeah, Jason Tatum to yeah. me is like, is the perfect NBA physique, right? 6'10", long, strong, but not muscle-bound. Jalen Brown's more um, athletic than Jason Tatum, but Jason Tatum is like the perfect NBA build. He's, he's stronger than Kevin Durant, but then again, so is pretty much everybody else in the league. And as Durant said during um, the draft process when he couldn't even bench press, what, like 190 pounds once, he goes, the basketball's not that heavy, so I, I can deal with that. Yeah. England yeah. reminds me a lot of a poor man's Kevin Durant, in fact, when he was coming out of Duke, uh, Kevin Durant That's says – everybody compared him to, yeah. Kevin Durant says, man, it looks like I'm looking in the mirror when I see this guy. Now, obviously, he's not Kevin Durant, but he's he's a poor man's version of him, but that's a compliment. So, But the Zion durability factor is a concern. He's 6'7", listed at 285. He may be heavier. He's, he's a monster. Uh, he's so explosive, but he's going to have to keep tabs on his weight. And living in New Orleans isn't exactly the best city – to live in, to watch your weight. I mean, the, the cuisine in New Orleans is second to none. So he's going to have to be careful with that. I, I do think his ceiling is the highest. And I'm also going to throw one more thing in, Jet. And I think as a recruiter for potential free agents, Zion would be the best of the four. Yet Tatum is incredibly popular amongst his peers. and among, he, he is, is. Uh, also, you know, all over the place now. He's got a Subway commercial. He's on the cover of Ruffles potato chips so he's got star power and i think and jalen brown is the vice president of the players association and somebody i think that a lot of players respect what he has to say and speaks out about i wonder though okay i love jalen brown you know that he's my favorite celtic one of my five favorite players in the league i wonder if that could sometimes be a turnoff because chris paul has been the president of the players association and you know player in that position i wonder if he turns some people off Jalen Brown's incredibly bright. He was the valedictorian of his high school. Maybe some of the players look and say, this guy's a know-it-all. I, I you know, don't want to put up with that. Maybe. I think when, also he's a natural leader. I think that might absolutely. be more about what it is. But absolutely, he hasn't really had the ability to try to recruit a guy yet. So, well, I don't know. Also, Zion's got a tremendous personality. He's a, you know, well, he's, he's a great kid. But I don't know anything like that he stands for or what he's about other than he really likes playing basketball and is a happy, happy guy. At the beginning of the pandemic, though, when the NBA shut down for a while, he contributed one month's uh, pay for all the workers at the arena that the Pelicans play in. That's great. So, I mean, look, the the NBA players are are great at that. They they are far better than any other athlete. We we know Tatum is, you know, very conscious. Tatum is going to run for the U.S. Senate someday. And if he does and I'm still alive, I'll I'll go help him. Brown, you mean? Uh, I mean, Brown. Tatum's not running for the Senate. No, I don't picture Tatum running for the Senate. (laughs) Brown's going to run for the Senate. Tatum, Tatum to me, is just this incredibly talented guy who's been incredibly productive. I mean, one of the best-looking players in the league. I mean, like, the girls love him. Like, my niece is in her late 30s. She thinks he's, like, the hottest guy in the NBA. Like, the the women love Jason Tatum. He's just – he's a likable guy. He's almost like your little brother that's grown up, and you go, wow, this guy's really accomplished. Um but Zion has that personality, doesn't he? Where he's just like, he's, he's got kind of a shack type personality that you can't help but like him because he's so big and strong and, and his skill set. There haven't been a lot of players in the history of the league that are like that. Right. I mean, yeah. Like, so this, uh, in terms of my argument, Sap, it, it's, I guess it's less about Zion. The durability is an, is a concern for me and more about Brandon Ingram. Do you know how many times Brandon Ingram has been to the playoffs in his NBA career? Zero. 
That's zero. That's correct. He has been to zero postseasons. I think that there is a reason behind that. This year, the Pelicans have been disappointing. They were extremely disappointing in the bubble. The bubble expanded bubble was created specifically for the Pelicans to try to get into the playoffs. They did not. Uh, Brandon Ingram didn't deliver when he was with LeBron James, who has elevated basically every teammate he's ever been with, except for his first year with the Lakers, where they were disappointing. And, and Chris Bosh. Make the and Chris Bosh never elevated with LeBron. He had to take a step back, but Bosh was already a multiple time. Did time. win championships there at least. They did. They did. And and, and Ingram again. That that's a great point. That he's never been to the postseason. Obviously, Zion is in his second year. But now, and it's see- cr- go ahead. I was going to say, as you know, as crappy as this year has gone for the Celtics, Brown and Tatum have had postseason success, been to the postseason and been successful into the postseason. In in Tatum's first year, he was a star in the playoffs for the Celtics. And here's Brandon Ingram, who hasn't even been to the playoffs, let alone get to the conference finals. That Celtic team was was better than any Laker team that Ingram played on. And I get LeBron was there two years ago, but then LeBron got hurt uh, on Christmas Day of mm. 2018. And the Lakers were the four seed when that happened. I think if LeBron didn't get hurt that year, they would have made the playoffs. Uh, now, But here's the thing with the four players we're talking about, right? Now they're the lead dogs of their franchises, right? Tatum and Brown in Boston, Zion and Ingram in New Orleans. They're undisputably, these are the – Two best players in Boston, the two best players in New Orleans. Their records aren't that different this year. The Celtics are 21 and 23. New Orleans is 19 and 24 in what I think is a tougher Western Conference. So they have had playoff success, but they've always had veteran players around them that they've been able to feed off of, whether it was Al Horford or Gordon Hayward or Kemba Walker last year. So they've, they've played on better teams than this current New Orleans team or even when Brandon Ingram was in L.A. outside of that two-and-a-half-month stretch where LeBron was healthy. And also, you know, on that LeBron team, too, that was his third year in the league. Everybody's expecting Ingram to really uh, get going. He started his career slower than a lot of people expect, especially mm-hmm. for the number two overall pick. Nine points a game his first year, 16 in his second year, and then the third year LeBron comes in, and they're like, okay, he's really going to pick it up. He's the second option to LeBron. He only goes for 18 points a game. He shoots 67% from the free throw line. Uh, Uh, That's not good. Again, like you said, like you said with um, Tatum, there does seem to be a sense of apathy with Ingram too, in my mind, in terms of he has got a lot of skills. Maybe it's a Duke Duke thing. thing? I don't know. Uh, Outside of Zion. Zion, you know, seems to be an outlier. The Duke guys think that their shit is ice cream. We know that. We get that from Christian Leitner going forward. Grand Hill was kind of an outlier, but Grand Hill was just a very unique individual. But most of the Duke guys, their opinion of themselves is through the roof. Obviously, Kyrie Irving probably more so than any. So maybe <laughs> it's a Duke yeah. thing where it, it's almost like they're playing down by joining the NBA. Like Duke is the pinnacle of their career, and then they go to the NBA, and it's never the same. I think Zion's a little bit different. Zion's just got a different personality than Ingram or Tatum. Yeah, it might be a Duke thing. It's it's not a bad thought. Uh, it does seem to be. There's obviously that that uh, air of arrogance that mm-hmm. comes with Duke and and Coach K and and all that stuff. So yeah, and I mean, if you're being recruited by Duke, you're one of the very very best players in the country. So it's uh, you know it's a big deal. Um, I just with with Ingram, I I see the skill set is remarkable. I don't think that he stands out as a, a a guy to me that is he's not Kevin Durant. He doesn't have, he's like Kevin Durant light and he, so you don't have that Durant thing, but he also doesn't have that killer instinct. I know Durant doesn't necessarily either, but he's just so good that it doesn't matter. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I feel, listen, I I've said this the other day. I don't think the Celtics two stars are, superstars and i don't know that they'll ever get to that point but i do feel more comfortable with the fact that they've had in their young careers a lot more success in terms of winning than brandon ingram now and zion 
the durability I, I mentioned, and also this year he's played and the team still is, has not really improved all that much. So I, I don't know. Listen, he, he's in his second year and sometimes it takes players a while, a while to figure out how to win in the league. But I am surprised that they're sitting right now behind teams like the Kings and the Grizzlies and the Spurs in the West right now. And they're only a, uh, and they are only a half game up on a team like the Thunder, who have basically decided to completely rebuild. So, I, I, considering those two guys play every night, and they have Stephen Adams and Lonzo Ball, I'm, I'm not sure why they haven't been able to at least get into the conversation of trying to get into the playoffs this year. And yeah, no, I think they've been, underachieved. They I haven't I been able to turn you. the corner. No, I think I think. Both of these teams have underachieved this year, right? The Celtics and New Orleans. We were hoping for better from both of them. I mean, New Orleans seems to be on national TV like once a week, and it's because obviously of Zion. I'm not a big Stan Van Gundy fan. I love him on Twitter. I agree with a lot of his politics. But as a coach, I think he maybe has passed his prime. Maybe his way of doing things doesn't fit into today's NBA. So I don't think they're going to move off of Stan Van Gundy after one year. But uh, I think it's a good conversation because we're talking about three Duke guys here, right? And Tatum, Zion, and Ingram, and then Brown, who's from Cal. So we're, we're talking about four guys that went to really good schools. So there is kind of that built-in arrogance, you know, when you go to Duke and even Cal. So we're talking about four guys yeah. that probably – I don't think they have maturity issues, but they have to learn that the game is maybe tougher than they think it is. Uh, it is – it is – funny how Duke for a long time, you know, it was obviously a premier program, but didn't produce like the NBA star level players. And now no. with the one and dones being so popular, coach K has obviously shifted his recruiting strategy. And now you're starting to see a ton of these top guys come out of Duke and really perform at the NBA level. It, you know, it was like a punchline for long. Like they were, you know, great at Duke and then they would come out and they'd be, you know, middling to bad in the NBA. And now, I mean, they're, they're, putting out top picks every year. So uh, th- it just shows you the, that college basketball has changed so much in terms of how but teams had their misses view who too, they though, want. Right? But they've had their misses too, Jet, right? I mean, like every program does. Not not every program is going to produce great NBA players. I mean, I think Kentucky's produced more top-level players than Duke. North Carolina in totality has probably produced more top-level players than Duke. But even recently, you know, you're talking about what, Wendell Carter Jr. was a high pick. He's been a – it's been okay. Yeah. Um, Jaleel Okafor. Jaleel Okafor was the third pick. What was uh, Begley the third was the second pick in the draft taken before yeah. Luka Doncic. He's not really all that good. So they've had their misses. Now Tatum has been pretty much a home run. I think he still has room to grow. Ingram yeah. has been maybe a triple. We'll call it that. I think Zion has a chance to be a grand slam. Uh, I think yeah. of all Kyrie. these guys, he has a chance to be. Kyrie, without question, is is the best pro player to come out of Duke, even more so than Grant Hill. Grant Hill was great. Kyrie's at another level. I mean, the only problem with Kyrie, he's not as And he only played like Grant nine Hill. games at Duke, too. Yeah, and you still knew. It took about nine minutes to, to see him and say, wow, this guy is pretty special. I mean, in terms of pure talent and, and at times productivity, he's the best player to come out of Duke without question. Grant Hill in totality has had the best career. He's the only Duke player that's in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, he got mm. in there partly because – he was great in college as well, because that's obviously factored into the basketball Hall of Fame. Kyrie right. will be in the Hall of Fame at some point. I, I don't even doubt that. He's he won a championship, hit a big shot. He's had a marvelous career, albeit he's not a durable guy. And I, I think I think Zion and Tatum are on that track. I don't think Ingram's on that track. And I wouldn't say that Brown's on that track yet. But I, I kind of look at Ingram and Brown as pretty similar. And just personal taste, I would take Zion over Tatum. That's how I came to this. I just thought the poll would be closer than 73-27, but a lot of it has to do with I've got more Celtics followers than Pelicans followers. Yeah, I mean, that was your mistake thinking it'd be closer, Sap, so that's, that's on uh, you. I make a lot of mistakes, Jed. I do. You do. You do. And, uh, and of course, Twitter only gives you those four poll options, so you couldn't do, you know, the poll you wanted with every duo in the NBA uh, and see how that with the young duos. Out. I went with the young duos. You know, I mean, like, I would have put Luca in there, but is Porzingis really in the same class as these four players? He can no. be if he's healthy, but certainly Luke is the best player of all these young players without question. But yeah, that, I, that, I guess that another an one would be like 
Towns and Edwards now would be an interesting question. Yeah, Minnesota, man, they can't get anything right. I mean, Embiid and Simmons, Embiid's been in the league since 2014, although he hasn't yeah. played as much as some other players that were drafted in that year. I mean, Embiid, Simmons would be certainly – uh, an interesting duo. I'm going with this one out of these two because of Zion's age. And I, I really, I think Zion's going to be the face of the league in about three or four years. That That's my um, feeling. Wrote the column about it. We had that discussion last week on one of the podcasts. I, I think his ceiling is that. Gotta high. start I think winning. He will help recruit. He, absolutely. You've got to start winning. Even if you get to the playoffs and lose in the first round, especially in the West, that's still better than not making the playoffs. Because Jordan, his first year got to the playoffs lost to the Bucks, I believe, in the first round. Second year, made it to the playoffs, coming off a broken foot where he missed about three months. Scared the hell out of the Celtics, with maybe the greatest team ever. Uh, even though they got swept, he, he kept them close in two of those games at the old Boston Garden. And, and even LeBron, by his third year, was making the playoffs by his, what, fourth year? He was in the NBA Finals. So, yeah, yeah Zion's got to start winning at some point. And, and Again, maybe he's just a player that's going to put up great numbers and he's not a force multiplier. I don't know if any of these guys are force multipliers. We, we've talked about Tatum and Brown. They, they seem to play in a vacuum. Ingram is a pretty good passer and facilitator, but who's he ever made better? I think Zion maybe has a chance to be the best of the group as a force multiplier because I also think he probably has the highest ceiling defensively. He's been a little bit of a disappointment defensively so far, but I think he can become a, a very good defensive player. Yeah, I actually Brown's are Brown is the best of, of that group defensively right now. Uh, I can buy by far. Into that. I, yeah. I, I I do think Tatum has the highest ceiling defensively because of his wingspan being so long, yeah. and he's. But it's that it's sort of irrelevant right now to speculate on who's going to be the best of them defensively. But I think it's a fair argument uh, either way. You can't go wrong. I mean, uh, I I think most GMs would probably shade towards the Pelicans purely because of Zion, not because mm-hmm. of Ingram, but because they, the potential of, of Zion being a guy mm-hmm. that you can be the best player in a championship team. I think it's becoming abundantly clear that Tatum and Brown and obviously Ingram, none of those guys could be the best player on a championship team. And, no. and Zion is just, it, you don't know yet. So it's a good question, Sap. Credit to you for a good poll question. And uh, and uh, we'll see how the next couple of years will you know answer that question. That's That's the only way to know is time. Uh, so that will do it for this edition of the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Make sure to check out their website, fullpresscoverage.com, for great articles, podcasts, you name it, they have it. This, again, Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. Thanks for listening, everybody.